our setup keeps getting uh, more interesting each time. It it gets busier. <laughs> the podcast setup gets decidedly busier every time. For sure. For sure. But better? Question mark? We're we're getting getting better every day. Are we? Just like in that song from that one musical. Evan Hansen. Getting better every oh. day. Hey, 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 hey. Um How about no? How about no? How about maybe? I mean mm-hmm. how about people come and watch our Magic the Gathering streams on TikTok? They do that. So many people have been doing that and it's been phenomenal. We've had a lot of fun doing those recently. So in much fun. The past couple well, yeah, we did one yesterday. It was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. Had a lot of viewers. We just we've been we've been doing a new format. We used to play like two player commander, and we still do that. But we also have jumpstart packs, and we do we crack a little bit of jumpstart and play some Magic the Gathering, which is great. It's well, a great that, time. That's a great time. You know what we haven't been doing as much of? Playing D and D. No, no. I mean, to be fair, there's been a lot of contention around D and D here recently. It's, it's and our been, lives have been busy. It's been difficult to get excited to play the dungeons and the dragons and the dragons. Which is a bit of a shame, but I still play in my work game. I'm still I playing s- a Star Wars game. We, we, I need, we need to find a fifth person because I am hell, I've, I've said this many a time. I am hell bent on running the call of the Netherdeep campaign. Yes. Hell bent on it. It's going to happen. When? I don't know. Hopefully in the coming months, seeing as excited, exciting thing for me. I have a set schedule at work now, so I don't have to change my fucking shift every week. Woohoo! Which is great. So I can actually plan to do things more consistently. Woohoo! Very, very exciting. Other things that are exciting, since the last time we recorded, Keys from the Golden Vault is out. It is. The new anthology book from Wizards of the Coast and Dungeons and Dragons. Love a heist. Absolutely love a heist. There have been a lot of, if you go on to D&D Beyond, uh, there have been a lot of um, posts from Wizards about, oh, here's how you run a heist. Do you want to make a heist? Here's how to, here's a little, uh, here's a little four-step heist plan. I'm, the heist is like the quintessential adventure uh-huh. in many ways. It, there's a, there is a Netflix show out right now that's fairly new called Kaleidoscope that it, the entire premise is built around this group of people having to perform a heist and Mm. you can watch like all but the heist episode in whatever order you want. The heist episode has to be last, all this kind of stuff. It's a bit like that part's a bit of a gimmick, but the actual story is really cool. And just heists in general, oceans 11. Sure. James, it's love a heist. Absolutely love a heist. And keys from the golden vault has generally been pretty well received as all these anthology books have been pretty well received. Yes. It's one of the it's one of the better formats. We're on record for saying that we appreciate the anthology books maybe a little more than the other books they put out here, especially in the recent year. Absolutely, absolutely. So if you're interested, keys from the Golden Vault. If you want to buy it, use our Amazon affiliate link. We don't have it up in there in any of the lists, but if you click the link and then you buy it, it still helps us out. We appreciate that. Also, Dimension Twenty. Yeah, they announced they, a new uh, a new a new campaign coming up. Yes, and then the teaser they showed that it was not going to be DM'd by one Brennan Lee Mulligan. No, but BLM instead, himself. But instead, the f- friend of their show, Matt Mercer. Matthew Mercer, the DM of, of Critical Role. As if any, anybody who's listening didn't yeah, know that already, is going to be DMing Dimension Twenty. Ridiculous. Ridiculous! I love it. Ridiculous! I love I love the little cross pollination that's going on with the big D and D streams streamers. Stream? I, don't, I don't I don't feel Groups? I don't feel right I don't feel right calling Brennan Lee Mulligan and Matt Mercer D and D streamers. No, no, we're we're not even stream. We're on the opposite end of streamers. We don't stream D and D, but no, but no, but like yeah, no, like don't. people like Whipjack. Yeah, she's, she's a she is decidedly a D and D. She's D and D streamer. Uh, Friend of the show, Fell the Leb, Norb. Yeah. Currently D D streamer. Yeah. On a couple of streams with uh Oh my gosh. Oh with, my gosh. Uh, Runesmith. Runesmith. Who's the one DMing that? Why am Joe I drawing Cat. a blank? Joe Cat is DMing that game. Highly recommend. Check out Joe Cat on YouTube. Their their current streamed campaign features Friend of the Show. Norb. Fell the Leb. Highly recommend. I'm talking very circularly. 
Huh? You talked very circularly. I mean, You're like, friend of the show, Fell the Lab, is on a stream featuring friend of the show, Fell the Lab. Fell the Lab. I mean, I love Norb. Norb, the last time there was a D&D, uh, one D&D drop came on, came over to the house and discussed the cleric, and we might want to, we might want to try to have him on here again. Might be down for it. If he is interested in schedules, can align, but... Before we get too far, we should introduce ourselves. Yes, I'm Connor. And I'm Sam. And we are the Dungeon Bros, but we are not brothers. Nor are we in a dungeon. We are in a dimly lit office. Yes. As is always the case, or at least in, in recent episodes. We moved here. No, we haven't moved houses. <laughs> we still have We still have the same place, but we've moved where we record the podcast. I think this is decidedly an improvement. Indeed. 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 Upcoming releases from Wizards of the Coast pertaining to the Dungeons and the Dragons, but mostly, but mostly, but mostly the uh, Magic the Gathering. Magic the Gathering. We're looking forward to Q2 and Q3 of this year. Uh, March of the Machines is coming out next. Oh, it's not next month yet. By the time you listen to this, it'll be next month. It will be. It'll be uh, March of the Machines coming out April 21st. Uh, and then in uh, in June of this year, the Lord of the Rings universes beyond set is going to drop. Um, they just want all of all of the Connor Bright money. Yeah, you're going to go broke. All of you are going to just you know. I'm I'm not saying I'm going to max out my credit cards, and I'm currently increasing my credit limits to be able to max out my credit cards even further for Magic the Gathering, Lord of the Rings themed stuff, but. I'm not opposed to that idea. I mean, I will be trying to collect all of the uh, the new cards and the cards in the reprints that have Lord of the Rings treatments in the art because I'm obsessive mm -hmm. and I can't stop myself. But also coming out very soon, Dungeons and Dragons: Honor Among Thieves. Yes, the film, D and D hat, D and D hat, <laughs> the D and D hat movie. Uh, Another popular clip that's been running around is them doing Speak with Dead. Yes. And only getting one question in because they keep asking, like, rules <laughs> rules about the spell itself. And then the dead being keeps answering them. And then it's hilarious. It, I, I'm really excited for this movie, genuinely. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be plenty of people boycotting it because of all the 1D&D &D stuff. Or not the 1D, the OGL stuff. Um, I'm not gonna do that we'll see it we'll talk about we'll it we'll see we'll talk we'll probably have an entire episode reviewing the honor among thieves indeed indeed we already went over key, keys from the golden vault the frexy all will be one's been out for a little bit yada 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 but i think it's time we talk about the big kahuna we need to jump right in we're gonna jump right into this unearthed arcana 2023 we have another one D, &D play test for the next iteration of Dungeons and Dragons Player's Handbook featuring the Druid and the Paladin. Lot of lot of changes. A lot of changes. These are the other two members of the priest class group. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we might as well just jump right into it. The Druid. The Druid. So the main changes here. The big one. They no longer have wild shape. It is now called Channel Nature. Which includes the ability called Wild Shape. Yes. So Channel Nature is going to start out with two uses, and then by the time you are level, what is that, nine, you'll get up to four uses. And then you stay there. And then you just stay there the rest of your time as a druid. Uh, you regain whenever you finish a short or a long rest. Oh, you regain one use when you finish a short rest. You regain all of them on a long rest. So a little bit of a hybrid short rest, long rest recharge mechanic, which I'm personally in favor of. Yeah, I mean, we. there's been a long prediction that they're trying to get rid of the short rest, but I think if they continue to add more features like giving giving more classes things back on short rests, because mm -hmm. before it was, of course, just healing and the warlock, basically. Yes. High-level bards, and that's about it. Yeah. Now, I'm, I'm not in favor of getting rid of the short rest. What I am in favor of is... Short closing the gap between the short rest and the long rest classes, mm -hmm. giving situations where they can both shine a bit more and encourage the use of the short rest other than the warlock being like, let's take a fucking break for an hour. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But channel nature. It is a magic action. DCs DCs for things are the same as your spell save DC spell casting, all that kind of stuff. 
The main one that you get access to is Wild Shape. As a magic action, you can transform into a form that you have learned for this feature. You start knowing one form, Animal of the Land, which is detailed later. Uh, you stay in that form uh, equal to a number of hours, equal to half your druid level, or into, until you use Wild Shape again, have the incapacitated condition, or die. You can end a Wild Shape early as a bonus action. While in this form, your game statistics are repla- their game statistics replace yours, and your ability to handle objects is determined by the form's limbs rather than by your own. You retain your personality, memories, ability to speak, and the wild shape feature. You lose access to all of your other features, such as the ability to cast spells, though you can continue to concentrate on one. When you transform, you choose whether your equipment falls to the ground in the space. Uh, where you cha- transformed or merges into your new form. Equipment that merges with your form has no effect until you leave that form. They also made a note here for Channel Divinity and Channel Nature. Uh, they have gone away from using the proficiency bonus as the number of uses you have for those features, simply so that you don't aren't able to multi-class into multiple classes where you can get a channel divinity and nature and all this kind of stuff. And then it ha- all scales with you level regardless of what class you're in. So they're having fixed number uses for those rather than based on your proficiency bonus. Ultimately, it still it coincides very closely with the proficiency bonus uses, but it doesn't actually scale if you only dipped like one level into druid, right. for example. Massive, massive changes here. Yeah. So, uh, uh, of course, the wild shape being pinnacle to the druid, and I'd say literally half of the reason most people play the druid, the other half being yes. the fact that you can cast overpowered spells. Um, and and we've been saying for a long time that the druid needs a needs a bit of a rework. <laughs> Min maxers love it, but uh, for the rest of us. They just took all the flavor that the wild shape offered and just slurped it right out. Just distilled it all down to a very basic stat block. And my God, if we look at that stat block, which I do, I do want to look at stat blocks right now. Yeah. Let, yeah let, let's look at them real quick. Not all three. Just we'll the, do them the, at, when they come up. So the animal of the land, small, medium, or large terrestrial animal, your creature type does not change. Your AC is 10 plus your wisdom. Your hit points, you continue to use your own hit points and hit dice. Another massive nerf. Yes. Your speed is 40 feet, and when you reach 5th level, you have a climbing speed of 40 feet. Your strength and dexterity are equal to your wisdom score. Your constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma all stay the same. I would argue also another big nerf. Mm Mm-hmm. You have 60 feet of dark vision. You know all the languages that you know. Your proficiency bonus stays the same. You have keen senses, so you get advantage on wisdom perception checks. And you have two actions. The bestial strike is a melee attack. You use your spell attack modifier to hit. The reach is five feet, one target. On a hit, it deals 1d8 plus your wisdom modifier for bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing damage, your choice. And then the multi-attack when you get to fifth level, allowing you to make two bestial strikes. Yeah, so that was again. That was a big part of 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 uh, when people became or chose Druid. They, our, our buddy of ours in the Nether Deep campaign, he he went back and forth with both of us for hours, being like, "Should I choose wolf or bear? Should I should I become a wolf or a bear?" And and then he became a spider. <laughs> became a spider. <laughs> um, man, that hit points going away to uh, to just becoming your own hit points. Yeah, like that's I think maybe one of the biggest. Right off the bat. Yeah. I want to take a quick sidebar and shout out Sand Tiger 3 for gifting us on the TikTok live. We do record the podcast live on TikTok, and we don't often choose to interact with people during the live. We wait until the end, but they sent us a gift, so what's up? We appreciate you. You a baller. Um, hang around. We'll talk at the end. Sure. For sure. For sure. This also takes away one of the main advantages that wild shaping would cause like this form of wild shape why would you choose to do this yeah what benefit do you get from this you get 10 extra feet of movement your ac might go up a little bit maybe your hit points stay the same you gain dark vision your strength and dex are probably going to go up you get advantage on perception checks so kind of you're just like all right i want to look around i guess i'll expend my wild shape okay maybe you need to make like a a strength check to for, or a dexterity check for something. Yeah. But other than that, yeah. yeah. 
you you know there's no you lose you lose you can't become a spider and get spider climb yep. you can't become a wolf and get their ability to when you charge fifth you know 20 feet before you make an attack mm-hmm. force of strength so um and and then of course now your attack is just 1d8 plus your wisdom modifier yep when, Does, doesn't matter what size you are a if you turn into a squirrel or if you turn into a brown bear well you can't turn into a squirrel because oh, it is it's... a tiny creature yeah. you can't do that until level 11 if you turn into a cat or a bear, you were dealing 1d8 plus your wisdom modifier. Yeah. It, all, all of the flavor, all of the utility from the wild shape is being almost completely stripped away. At least with this level one. You do get it at level one, though. You it's, do get it at level one. So that's an improvement, I guess. At level one, you also get druidic. It's the secret language of the druids. You can speak the language and you can use it to leave messages. Uh, and then it specifies investigation checks to figure it out without magic, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you also get first level spell casting. Uh, it suggests some prepared spells. You finish a long rest is when you get them back. Um, it has suggestions for what spells to take. Spell slots are the same. You still use wisdom. You can still use a druidic focus for your spell casting. All of that is unchanged. Yep. A fairly, a fairly, a fairly chunky level one. I I think that giving them. Um giving them something you know the this main thing in at level one and level two is good to keep them in line with a lot of other things at what is it is it fair to take it down to such a piddly level of the I, wild shape i don't think so i think it would be perfectly fine if they just like Maybe instead of opening it up to all beasts of all CRs and have that weird table and you have to find it yourself in the player's handbook, maybe just list all of the stat blocks you can use. Or if you really wanted to, you could be like, you can be this spider only. You mm-hmm. can look like whatever you want, but this is the spider stat block and this is the bear stat block and this is the wolf. And curate a list of five, eight, whatever number yeah. you want. And then these are the things you can transform into and they can look however you want. And if you want to do something like, ooh, I want to be a panther, then just use the tiger stat block and call yourself a panther and look like a panther yeah. or, or a lion or whatever. Whereas this, it there's very little benefit for doing it. Um, it you don't get the buff of HP. Yeah, You can't do fun things. None of your other class features work. So you can no longer be a raging druid if you yeah. multiclassed with barbarian, which is such a fun option in a off the wall multiclass that is just now completely useless to you. Yeah. Uh, though I do find it interesting that they decided to say you can still speak. Sure. Sure. Whatever. That's like that. I mean, that was a big thing. Like you can't speak until level I think eighteen. <laughs> Yeah, because that's something that's something that really needs to be gated that hard. <laughs> anyway, but if they're going to give you a speak, they should have let you just cast spells at that point, or maybe even just can- anyway. Anyway, anyway, I think that we said enough on on le- the first level. I agree. Second level, nature's aid. You learn two new ways to use your channel in nature: healing blossoms and the wild companion. Healing blossoms is a magic action. You can channel healing energy that appears as blooming flowers. Choose a point within thirty feet of your spell yourself. <laughs> And spectral flowers appear for a moment in a 10-foot radius sphere centered on that point. Then roll a number of d4s equal to your wisdom modifier, minimum of one, and add the dice together. The total is the number of hit points you can distribute to creatures within that sphere. You decide the number of hit points that are restored to each of those creatures, deducting the healing from the total. So you kind of, you just create a somewhat random pool of hit points, Mm -hmm. and you can just get a bunch of people up within a 30 foot radius which is or sorry a 10 foot radius within 30 feet of yourself yeah that's a so i think that's a solid alternate use for sure i i mean i think if it were regular wild shape then no if we're 2014 wild shape then that wouldn't be i would never use that probably Absolutely. rarely ever use that um but it's it's a nice little it's a nice little yeah like you said get people up that's about yeah. all you're gonna use it for yeah now the thing that I think people would most use the druid uh oh my gosh I'm already forgetting the names channel nature <laughs> the thing that you would most likely use the channel nature for is the wild companion 
You summon a nature spirit that assumes an animal form to aid you. As a magic action, you can expend a use of your channel nature and cast the Find Familiar spell without material components. When you cast the spell this way, the familiar is a fey, and it disappears when you finish a long rest. I think in most every situation, you would rather have a familiar for one of your uses of channel nature than either of the other two options. Yeah, at this point, the uh, the Find Familiar spell, which I believe they did modify... They did a little bit. Um, did a little bit of modification. Yeah, much more useful. Yeah. Um, for recon, for distraction, for just having a buddy. Mm-hmm. Let's be honest. Most people use it for just having a buddy. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's what I do it for. <laughs> <laughs> right? Level three, you get your druid subclass. This Unearthed Arcana details the Circle of the Moon Druid, and you get additional uh, subclass features at level six, at level 10, and... At level 14, like every other class, they are now synergistic. Mm -hmm. And we'll get to the Circle of the Moon Druid after we go through the base druid. Yes. Level four, you get a feat. Standard. You can can choose the ability score improvement feat or another feat of your choice. Ability scores are a feat. At level five, you get Might of the Land. Your connection to the land deepens, empowering the animal of the land form. For your wild shape, you unlock the form's climb speed and the multi-attack portion. Great. Yeah. Yeah. So I will say before we go too much further, um, what I appreciate is they got rid of all of the dead levels because Druid had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight dead levels where they just get spell slots and spells. Yep. Um, That being said, again, that feature is kind of mediocre. Yeah. Um, yeah. especially because at this point in the 2014 version, you already have, uh, your aquatic, um, your aquatic form. Yes. Yes. You get that at level four. Yeah. You get this now at level seven. Again, level six was the subclass feature at level seven. You get your aquatic form. You learn the new form for your wild shape animal of the sea, which is described later. We will describe it now. Animal of the sea, small, medium, or large aquatic or aquatic or semi-aquatic animal. Armor class is the same, 10 plus your wisdom. Hit points are the same. You continue to use your own and your hit dice. Speed is 20, a swimming speed of 40. Your dexterity equals your wisdom score. And then your strength, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma remain the same. You have dark vision for 90 feet. You know all the same languages. Your proficiency bonus is the same. You get amphibious. You can breathe air and water. You also have two actions. Multi-attack, where you can make two bestial strikes and bestial strike. A melee attack that uses your spell attack modifier a range of five feet and it deals 1d6 plus your wisdom modifier bludgeoning piercing or slashing damage your choice a slightly worse creature option but it has the utility of having a swimming speed yes that's pretty much it at this point you can breathe underwater and you can swim faster then they and then they're like all right well you don't get to hit as as hard. You don't get to be a shark and bite as hard as you do as a no. as a cat slashing at somebody. Nope. Yeah, yeah. Your common house cat is going to be dealing more damage per round than a great white shark. Yep. And again, love you, it. You, again, it doesn't matter if you're small, medium, or large. Uh, you still can't be small. Yep. Uh, yeah, you're you're if if you're playing near an ocean. Or you have a lake puzzle or something, a temple of water puzzle some or something. This is going to be your time to shine. Yep. Uh, at level eight, you get a feat. At level nine, you gain the aerial form. New form for your wild shape, animal of the sky. The animal of the sky can be a small, medium, or large winged animal. Your AC is less. Eight plus your wisdom modifier. Your hit points remain the same. Your speed is 20 feet and you have a fly speed of 40. Your dexterity equals your wisdom score. Strength, constitution, intelligence, wisdom, and charisma are the same as yours. You have a dark vision out to 120 feet. You know all the same languages. Your proficiency bonus is the same. You have two static features. Flyby. You do not provoke opportunity attacks when you fly out of someone's reach. That was usually exclusive to the owl. The yes. giant owl. Yes. You also have keen senses for advantage on wisdom perception checks. You also get multi-attack to make two bestial strikes as well as bestial strike. A melee attack using your spell attack modifier to hit reaches five feet, dealing 1d4 plus your wisdom modifier, bludgeoning, piercing, or slashing damage. Yep. So in 2014, you got your flying form at level eight. Um, and at that point, you could also be 
creatures of CR1 or less, uh, which could include things like the giant eagle, a much, much better stat block than this. Mm -hmm. Like massively better. Uh, so they delay it by a level and then nerf the hell out of it. Yeah. And again, you're not allowed to, because I guess you're flying now. You can't do any, you got to do very little damage. Oh yeah. You, you get a 1d4 on damage. Oh yeah. Level 10, you get your subclass feature. Level 11, tiny critter. You gain the ability to become a tiny creature when you transform into your wild shape form. If you do so, you can stay in that form no longer than 10 minutes and the damage you deal in that form is half. So now you can be a little itty bitty spider or squirrel and sneak around all stealthy like for ten, ten minutes. Yeah, I don't. Again, the two big the two big focuses of when somebody became a you know used their druid white shape in the twenty fourteen version in point five point in five yeah, in five e either combat or sneaking around mostly sometimes the utility stuff and now it feels like they're just being like mm, no you have to use it for utility. We yeah. really don't want you fighting with it. That, that's not fair, everybody. Yeah. Uh, despite the fact that um, in the D&D movie, they want you to think that a druid can transform into an owlbear. An owlbear. And, and fight as an owlbear. What is that called again? It's an owlbear. Oh. Owl. Ooh, owlbear. At level 12, you get another feat. At level 13, you get alternating forms. You can use your bonus action to use your wild shape. You can then switch back. Oh, hold on! No, I totally, I totally misread that. You miffed, you, you, you I really miffed, mi- yeah. I, re- I really you missed, missed that. You can now rapidly shift between a wild shape form and your normal form. If you are in a wild shape form, you can switch to your normal form as a bonus action, and then you can switch back into that wild shape form within the next minute as a bonus action. Neither switch expends a use of wild shape, meaning you can transform back into a human and then cast a spell, and then you can switch back into your animal form. Why you would be doing that when the animal forms suck so much is beyond me. Right. This is the only thing, like, this is the only concept that I like. It's a um, great concept. Oh, yeah. If you if you did that for the 5e version, I, I there'd be, that'd be... Very powerful. Very, very powerful. Yeah, I'm raging, you know, running in as a bear. Oh, you know, okay, I've killed the things around me. Swi- switch out, cast something over there. Next turn, switch back in, go back to eating people. Yeah. That'd be... I'm, Great utility mm-hmm. for forms that don't really stack up at all. Level 14, you get your last subclass feature. At level 15, you get Wild Resurgence. You can use your wild shape. Primal magic radiates from you, allowing you to use healing blossoms as part of the same use of channel divinity. Encouraging you to use your wild shape. But again, why? Yeah. At level 15... In what universe do you want to be transforming into a creature that is going to simply be dealing 1d8 plus your wisdom modifier times two damage right, per when round? I, when I could be, you know, casting, I don't know, Firestorm. Yeah. Level 16, you get a feat. Level 17, beast spells. You can cast spells in any wild shape form. While in such a form, you can perform somatic and verbal components, and you don't need to provide free material components. If a spell consumes its material component, you cannot cast that spell while in your wild shape form. A buff. Yeah, yeah. So, because the that was level that was the level 18 feet, one of the level 18 features in 5e, um, and that that it prohibited all material components. But mm-hmm. this one makes sense, since if you have it morph into your body, why not? Yeah. Level 18, you get the Archdruid. You, whenever you roll initiative, you regain one use of your channel nature. In addition, the primal magic that you wield causes you to age more slowly. For every 10 years that pass, your body only ages one year. Yes, yeah, so this combines two. Well, it does something weird, but it combines basically the old uh, other 18th level feature um, of timeless body it stays the same but then arch druid was the level 20 feature and it just gave you an unlimited usage of your wild shapes fascinating um yeah that 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 was actually like a good 20th level ability yeah. in the 5e system and you get it a couple levels earlier but now it is massively nerfed again yes That's, there's a theme here with the druid at 19th level, you get the last feat. And then at level 20, you get an epic boon. There's a design note on the epic boon feature. Oh, epic. They have changed it slightly for the druid and the paladin, making it a more powerful version than offered previously. And they're going to revisit those classes, and they're going to add this additional benefit. The ability score increase. Choose one of your ability scores. That score increases by two, and that increase can raise your score above 20, but not above 30. 
So breaking the the 20 ability score barrier breaking at level 20. And you also get an epic boon. I'm totally fine with this. Level 20, break the game. Yes. Don't care. That's the point. Have at it. You're, you've hit the quote unquote max level. We will then we will now look at the druid subclass that they feature here, the Circle of the Moon Druid. At third level, you get Combat Wild Shape, and you gain a small collection of abilities. Abjuration Spells. While in your Wild Shape form, you can cast any spell you currently have prepared from the Abjuration School, provided the spell does not require a material component. Quick Attack. You can use Unarmed Strike as a bonus action. Swift Transformation. You can use your Wild Shape as a bonus action or a magic action, but no more than once a turn. So compared to the 20, or compared to 5e, I keep calling it a 2014 version. It's 5e. Uh, compared to 5e, of course, the Combat Wild Shape came in at second level, um, which allowed you to transform at bonus action speed and then gave you the ability to expend a spell slot as a bonus action to regain 1d8 hit points per spell level. Yes. The healing factor was kind of so-so in Mm -hmm. 5e. I like that you can cast Abjuration spells as a combat. I think that's a great mechanic. It limits the School of Magic, gives the Schools of Magic like a use outside of the wizard and costing less to add to your spell book. Uh, Quick attack, being able to make an additional attack as a bonus action, I think is totally fine. And the shape transformation, using it as a bonus action or a magic action, getting the option either way, but no more than once per turn is totally fine. And then later when you get the ability to basically flicker between your forms as bonus actions without using it, I yeah. think that's that's awesome. I think this is a great design. If the wild <laughs> shapes didn't suck. Yeah, this kind I mean, uh, for a third level ability, if the wild shapes in actually improved as you continue to level up, mm-hmm. that'd be one thing. This would make a this would make this almost acceptable. But uh, once you hit their level, sure, this becomes pretty decent. But then it immediately starts to drop off. Absolutely. At sixth level, you get elemental wild shape. Whenever you assume a wild shape form, choose one of the following damage types: acid, cold, fire, lightning, or thunder. While in that form, you have resistance to the chosen damage type, and the form's bestial strike can deal damage of that type rather than its normal type, with you choosing between the types when you hit. Your form also displays sign of, of the chosen damage type. For example, if you chose fire, your fur and wild shape might flicker with harmless flames. You can choose the details. Hey, you can choose the details. Like, that's not the whole point of this fucking game. I know, right? <laughs> Elemental wild shape, much worse yeah. than, the, than the option in 5e. Yeah, in 5e, it was a 10th level ability in which uh, you got to transform into an air elemental, earth elemental, fire elemental, or a water elemental. All of which are going to be much better than any of the beast options available in any of the monster manuals oh, or yeah. player's handbook. The like cornerstone feature of the combat wild of, of the, the moon, moon druid. druid, yes. Uh, and it's where we get the famous Kedia right from uh, the first the first <laughs> campaign of Critical Role. Oh, yeah. Um, was were you know, is that ability a little overpowered? Maybe who it, it depends on what power level you're playing with. Um, you have to look at it in relation to the r- level and the classes around you what is what is a 10th level wizard going to be doing yeah casting world altering levels of magic what is a paladin going to be doing taking down most any undead in like one or two hits with their smites like the power level is the power creep is very very high Mm -hmm. and getting an elemental stat block is powerful not game-breakingly powerful, in my opinion. No, but as we've often said, you know, the martial classes definitely need some help. Yeah. And, uh, but this, uh, the, the previous six level for uh, Druid was your attacks count as magical for, or for the purpose of overcoming resistances. And note that none of, none of the features here really, really have. No. No. So... Hope there's not a lot of mat of uh, a non-magical damage resistance for I'm, the new monster manual. You know, if the, if that's something that they're changing with the new monster manuals, uh, getting changing how they do resistances and vulnerabilities, fine, fine. But at this time, we don't know. We don't know. And it's again hard to look at these in isolation and just make a judgment call overall. Yeah. A tenth level, you get the elemental strike. When you deal damage with your bestial strikes, the target takes an additional 1d6 damage of the type you choose from Elemental Wild Shape. This damage increases to 2d6 when you reach 17th level in this class. At level 10, your 
highest damage option in your wild shape. 1d8 plus 1d6 plus your wisdom. Twice. Uh, three times for this, because you can oh, get yes, a bonus time. action yes, on strike. Yes, you get your unarmed strike as a bonus action. So three times. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. Fine. This should probably be the sixth level ability. I agree. And then the tenth level ability should be, you can pick from this new elemental... Ca- if you want to make an elemental stat block and then swap out damage types or swap out static features based on what element you choose, mm-hmm. I'm totally fine with that. Just make it not shit. <laughs> <laughs> and then finally, at 14th level, you get thousand forms. You have learned to use lunar magic to alter your physical form in innumerable ways. You always have the alter self spell prepared and you can cast it without expending a spell slot. It also does not count against the number of spells you have prepared. Interesting note here, it does not limit the number of times you can cast that spell. Correct. For free. So you can just always you cast have, Yeah, cast it at will. All you want all over the place. And that is as presented the druid. Yeah, um I can't imagine very many druids are gonna be happy about this. No, not at all. Not I can't at imagine all. very many min maxers are gonna be happy about this. <sighs> And here's the thing. They want to streamline the druid. They want to streamline all the classes. And the druid is exceptionally powerful. It is. And it is exceptionally uh, conflated. Or not conflated. um, Confusing. Yes. Oh, yeah. Not a very easy class to get into if you're a new player. This is a much easier class to get into. And if the stat blocks were different, I think this change is kind of fine. Maybe give a little bit of customization. Like, you can pick one of these static features, and it'd be, like, Keen Senses or mm-hmm. Spider Climb or all this stuff. And you can choose what the form looks like. And then you can get really weird things, like a lion that can walk on the ceilings. Or <laughs> I love that. And that's fun. Maybe, maybe, instead of tying everything to your current hit points and your wisdom modify, maybe have it scale with your druid level. That'd be cool. That would be fun. Maybe provide static... Instead of making strength and dex equal to your wisdom modifier, maybe make them static or a modifier based on your druid level, you know? So it actually feels like you're progressing as you gain more levels in this class. Absolutely. The damage probably should be a bit more, generally speaking. Maybe have the damage die change at certain levels Mm -hmm. from D8 to D10 to D12, even though that's still not so... (laughs) a ton it's better than a d8 it's better than a d6 better than a d4 i don't know if 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 they if, i don't know if wizards wants to come in with this and be and maybe maybe their whole idea which if they have a whole idea they should tell us but like maybe the whole idea is oh you you know we want to encourage dms to give their players more magic weapons and and have more magic items come into play so we're lowering the power level of everything and and we're hoping you make up for it with these thousand new magic items that'd be one thing but so far they've just told us we want to streamline it and get ready to never have to change it again yeah i don't know about that i li- i like aligning the the level that you get classes at so that it's the same across all the classes i'm totally fine with that yeah that's perfectly fine just and, you know, making power adjustments so that the druid doesn't remain this dominant full spellcaster choice. Totally fine with that. I'm even fine with them being like, here's the land option, here's the water option, here's the flying option. But give us a little something more. Yes. Like, like treat us, treat us with enough intelligence that we can figure out something that's going to work for us mm-hmm. and still work within the confines that you're trying to put the druid under. I, I, I put I, all around for the druid for me is just kind of a, a, a wet fart noise. Yeah. Like just, I said, there's one, there's one feature I appreciate here. And that is the alternating forms at level 13, the alternating forms. I even like the fact that. Chan- it's channel nature instead of wild shape, and you have options yeah. available to you. They've already, you can kind of already tell they've been wanting to go the way of creating summoning options with wild shape with mm-hmm. like the wildfire druid and other yeah. subclasses yeah. that have come out since. It, this all around, if you want to, if you, I, st- I still am not sold on a static stat block for the creature of the land, creature of the sea, creature, mm-hmm. all that stuff. But if they're going to go that route, 
They need to up the power level and they need to up the customizability. Yes. Because the one of the biggest draws, like, oh, well, if, if everyone was a min-maxer, everyone would constantly be changing into brown bears. Yeah. Or, cha- like, but no, people change into horses. They change into, uh, they change into crocodiles Mm -hmm. they change into uh the giant spider there's a whole lot of different options for the utility and the special abilities that come along with them the webbing in the spider the the pouncing ability with the lion and you could even get pack tactics with the wolf Mm -hmm. there's a whole lot of advantages for picking different forms whereas here there isn't really any advantage to picking this form you don't even get an hp buffer nope so Back to the drawing board with that one. Yeah, opinion. I would. I would say, um, as we all know, in about two weeks they will probably they will drop a playtest survey, mm-hmm. um, and uh, go fill that out when it comes out. Oh um, yeah, and tell the and tell wizards you missed the mark on this one, guys. They they are going to have a lot on their hands with this druid. The paladin, I feel like they were also going to have a lot on their hands with. Before we get to the paladin, I'm going to shill a little bit. So we need to be better about chilling. You can always, if you're liking what you're listening to or liking the live when you're watching this, please follow us on TikTok, Instagram, subscribe to us on YouTube. We've got we've got homebrew options. We haven't been making homebrew because, well, it's scary. <laughs> it's been a ride here. It the past has couple been weeks, a months. ride, years. It feels. <laughs> We have a Twitter. It's not in the link tree anywhere. But we also have an Amazon affiliate store, which is the best way to support us. And this episode is sponsored by Found Familiar Dice because they are the only people that have sent us dice. <laughs> and we'll be talking to them We will be quite soon. We will be talking to them very, very soon about the dice making process. We tried to previously, and internet sucks. <laughs> Specifically, internet connectivity. <laughs> yes. So we'll be doing that again. Uh, that is going to go up as a bonus episode in the coming weeks. Um is there, is there any other shilling that needs to be done? I mean, just as a reminder, uh, please, if you're in the chat and you want to ask a question, you can ask us about anything and we will get. And at the end of the podcast, we'll go through a and a and have some some chatting. How could I possibly forget the discord server, a community oh, yes. growing every live stream that we do, specifically <laughs> Magic the Gathering live streams is when they grow the most. And there's people in there that want to play. They want to play Magic. They want to play D&D. They want to interact. So get out there. Post some stuff. Answer my questions when I give you prompts to talk about things. <laughs> Fight God. <laughs> Fight to the unconscious. Not to the death. No, 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 no. We don't want to be anybody. rude. No. Not at all. Not at all. No. Not at all. No. Moving on, though, the other major half of this playtest is the paladin in mm-hmm. the priest group. A couple of things changing. You get spell casting at level one. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You also get the lay on hands feature. And interestingly, with this spell, the spell casting, you get two cantrips right out of the gate. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Love it. Love it. Love it. Ultimately, you are only ever going to know three cantrips at most. But getting cantrips right out of the gate, there's going to be a lot of great cantrip options. Uh, Depending on future 1D&D releases outside of the player's handbook, we might get some uh, some of the great melee cantrips that came around with the Blade Singer Wizard, mm-hmm. uh, Booming Blade, Green Flame Blade, and the like, that might be in the Priest group. That'd be pretty cool if it That'd was. That'd be pretty cool. Help out the Paladin quite a bit. That being said, at level one, you get Lay on Hands. Pretty much the same. Uh, you get a pool of healing power that replenishes when you take a long rest. With that pool, you can restore a total number of hit points equal to five times your paladin level. As a magic action, you touch a creature, which can also be yourself, and draw power from the pool of healing to restore a number of hit points to that creature up to the maximum amount remaining in the pool. In addition, you can expend five hit points from the pool of healing to remove the poisoned condition from that creature rather than using those points to restore hit points. Very similar, but... One difference. You can use it on the undead and constructs now. Yeah. Yeah. Not lovely. <laughs> Great. Robot. Heal. Heal. Mend. <laughs> I'm going to mend you, robot. Look out, artificer. <laughs> <laughs> Perfectly fine. And also, it only removes the poison condition instead of disease. Disease. Yeah. So, mechanically a bit better, but also, depending on the DM, you might have gotten off a little bit easy with uh, the frightened condition or other sorts of conditions. You also at first level get spell casting. Hallelujah. 
You get cantrips, Hallelujah. spell slots, Hallelujah. charisma, Hallelujah. holy symbol, fo- all all the, all the same, all the same. Uh, the spell slot progression is adjusted a little bit. It is still a half caster, so you only ever get up to fifth level spells. But because you start at level one with your spell casting instead of level two, yes, or, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it adjusts the lower end it a does, tiny yes. bit. It's not a huge deal. You get second level spells at fifth level, third level spells at ninth, fourth level at 13th, and then fifth level spells at 17th. Totally fine. No no bad changes here in my mind. Barely any changes at all. Exactly. Earlier spell casting, good. Uh, lay on hands, effectively the same. Mechanical definition for the poison condition. Totally fine. Perfect. Second level. The cornerstone feature, the divine smite. When you strike a target, you can channel divine energy to smite it. Immediately after you hit a target with an attack roll using a weapon or an unarmed strike, you can expend one spell slot to deal radiant damage to the target. The damage is 2d8 for a first level spell slot plus 1d8 for each slot level higher than first. You can use divine smite no more than once during a turn, and you can't use it on the same turn that you cast a spell. All right, let's start. Uh, let's start uh, some, tying them up. Some buffs hidden in here, but with a massive nerf. Yes. So I will say, uh, uh, wizards came out. I believe I don't remember where they said it exactly, but. For a long time, people have wanted the unarmed strike smite. Why yeah. can't my monk strike smite when he's punching somebody in the face? And wizards went, hey, you can sure. do that in your game. Totally fine. We don't want to put it in our book. The The other thing, people are like, why can't I be a ranged paladin and smite with a bow and arrow? Mm-hmm. Now you can. Now you can. It is an attack roll with a weapon or an unarmed strike. Doesn't designate melee or ranged weapon. It is any weapon. Any weapon. So now... <laughs> Paladin might as well just go dex instead of strength and shoot a longbow and smite the holy hand grenade. Holy hand grenade. Holy hand grenade. <laughs> um, though, uh, this is great buffs. Now we get into a little bit of one, oh, more, one more, one more buff. One more buff. It is not capped at five d eight maximum damage. It's oh, that is right. Is technically six d eight now. But which that's only a, once you get to 17th level and higher with 5th level spell slots. Which was a weird thing in the old version. It seemed like an odd limitation, but now it does not exist. Whether or not you should be doing that with your 5th level spell slot will leave up to the min-maxers. But the major downside here is you can no longer you can no longer do it for every attack, and you cannot cast a spell the same turn that you use it. Yes. You cannot combo your smite spells with the divine smite and you cannot divine smite multiple attacks on the same turn which is a massive debuff because that could have been really cool you can no longer go nova as they say no no yeah additionally uh you do not do extra damage against undead or fiends no and another interesting note immediately after you hit a target with an attack roll using a weapon or an unarmed strike this is after you roll a crit. Your divine smite is not going to be doubled by a critical hit. Only your attack. They reverted those rules. Hmm? Didn't they revert those rules? Did they? They reverted them back to 2014. Did they? Uh, I can go check real quick. Because well, the wording here is not with is not in the D20. It is in the wording of the feature of divine smite because it's immediately after you hit a target. So it is after the attack damage. This is how I've been, I've read into it and others online have read into it. The wording probably should get a little clarification there. What's the wording on on 2014? 2014, when you hit a creature with a melee weapon attack, you can expend one spell slot to deal radiant damage. So the wording here is immediately after you hit. Changing Mm. it from when you hit to after you hit. After you hit. So it is after the critical hit with a weapon. And then you get smite damage hmm. instead of during the hit, which also would get doubled. I, I feel that's going to be some clarification needed from Wizards of the Coast yep. before we can make our final judgment on that one. That also just feels like a limitation that didn't need to be there. Yeah. Cause if you want to limit it to once per turn and you don't want to let people cast a smite spell and use divine smite or 
Literally any other spell. And Literally cast any other spell. Just let it crit when you do use it then. Like, what different... Like, it, it's... Marshall, we... They have said they are changing the weapon system and marshals are going to get a buff with the weapon system. We have not seen the weapon system. They yes. probably should should be putting that out soon with I, the warrior group. I was going to say, I imagine they'll put it out with the warrior group. And so in this vacuum, this is a massive debuff. But if they change the weapons, it might level it back out, make things a bit better. Ultimately, I think Divine Smite is fine. Just a couple wordings, changes... The main, if they want to limit it to once per turn, I am okay with that limitation. It with the stipulation that you can use it with ranged and melee and unarmed strikes and it crits Mm -hmm. and you can use it with spells. If you want to limit it to once per turn, I think that's fine. I'm totally okay with that. Yeah. I think that's a fair limitation. But removing every, like stripping out all these little details from it, not as big a fan. And again, that could just come down to who wrote it versus who wrote 2014's version. Exactly. And I'm sure they'll be getting plenty of feedback. Oh, they'll right. be getting plenty of feedback. At second level, you also get a fighting style. You can choose the fighting style defense feat, or you gain another fighting style feat of your choice. When you gain a feat at later levels, fighting style feats are among your options, even though you are not a member of the warrior group. Yeah. So whenever you get in... ASI, or I guess in this case, a feat, you can choose another fighting style. Mm -hmm. That includes the archery fighting style. Indeed. So, go ranged paladin. (laughs) (laughs) Love it. I mean, you know, people have been saying if you want to play a ranger, play a a bow fighter with a bow, you know, now you could also play a holy paladin ranger. Paladin with a bow. Paladin with a bow. Uh, Even with the ranger changes uh, in in one D&D, which are Notably better. Notably better. Notably better. Notably better. I mean, you can't smite with the ranger. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> that's true. Um, but yeah, I mean, overall, that's p- going to be pretty much the same. I do like that they're opening up for the warrior class the chance to take more fighting styles. Mm-hmm. I do like that the warrior class, like various class groups, you can get s- their specific classes that can gain access to certain things related to another class group. They did the similar thing with the ranger getting yes. access to the warrior class group kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. That is really cool. At third level, you get channel divinity. You get you start with one channel divinity effect, divine sense. Other paladin features give additional channel divinity effect options. Each time you use a channel divinity, you choose which effect you want to use. You can use channel divinity twice. You regain one expended use when you finish a short rest and all of them on a long rest, combining the short and long rests yes. that we saw with uh, the druid. You gain additional uses when you reach certain paladin levels, as shown in the chart. Channel divinity saving throws are the same as your spell save. Divine sense as a bonus action. You can open your awareness to detect celestials, fiends, and undead for the next 10 minutes or until you have the incapacitated condition. You know the location of any creature of those types within 60 feet of yourself. You know its creature type. Within the same radius, you also detect the presence of any place or object that has been consecrated or desecrated as with... The Hallow spell. The exact same as Divine Sense, except it is two levels delayed and it lasts longer. And it's a bonus action instead of an action. But you have to use a channel divinity. At third level, it's kind of a dead ability in a lot of ways. I think that, yeah, the Divine Sense, as I've seen it played with most people, um, it's just kind of a, I don't know what else to do right now. I'm going to use it. Yeah. Um, uh, you know there there are spells. It, I feel like in divine sense, and they were you know it's kind of trying to take. This is trying to kind of bring it to like, um, oh, there's spells, and I'm not. Uh, I can't even think of what they are. I'm gonna look. Give me a second to look. You you vamp. I'm vamping. With the channel divinity, there will be other options available based on subclasses. The oath of devotion paladin is the subclass that is described here, but it does not. Oh, wait, it does. It does let you expend your channel divinity at level three. So at level three, you are going to have two options for the channel divinity. We will get to the subclass in a little bit. Uh, the detect spells. The, detect, uh, like, detect mad, good and evil, detect magic. The ability to just see those different auras. Yes. Yeah, so. It's, just, it's trying to bring, it feels like it's trying to bring that more in line and make it more, and make give you a use of it more than just, ah. Uh, yeah. 
I, it's fine. But at third level, you also get your subclass, which does seem to give you an alternate use for your channel divinity. We will go over subclass features after the main class. But again, you get them at level 6, level 10, and level 14, like every other class to keep them in line. Standardization. I'm totally fine with it. Perfectly fine. Lovely. Love F it. Fourth level, you get a feat. You can choose the ability score improvement feat or another feat of your choice. At level five, you gain extra attack. You can attack twice instead of once whenever you take the attack action on your turn. At fifth level, you also gain the Faithful Steed ability. You can easily call on the aid of an otherworldly steed. You always have the fine steed spell prepared, and it does not count against the number of spells you can prepare. When you cast this spell, its casting time is an action. You can also cast the spell once without expending a spell slot, and you regain the ability to do so when you finish a long rest. I think it is only pertinent that we scroll down to the find steed spell. It is a second level conjuration spell on the divine spell list. Normal casting time of 10 minutes, but you get it as an action for the paladin. Range of 30 feet, verbal somatic, instantaneous. Here is the description. You gain the service of an otherworldly being, which manifests as a loyal steed in an unoccupied space of your choice within range. The creature uses the otherworldly steed stat block. You, if you already have a steed from the spell, your steed is replaced by the new one. It resembles a large, rideable animal of your choice, such as a horse, camel, dire wolf, or an elk. Whenever you cast the spell, choose the steed's creature type, celestial, fey, or fiend, which determines certain traits in the stat block. Combat. The steed is an ally to you and your companions. In combat, it shares your initiative count and functions as a controlled mount, as defined in the rules on mounted combat. Note. Mounted Combat is not described in 1 D&D. You have to use the original player's handbook rules for Mounted Combat currently. If you have the incapacitated condition, it takes its turn immediately after yours and acts independently, focusing on protecting you. Disappearance of the Steed. The Steed disappears if it drops to zero hit points, if you dismiss it as a bonus action, or if you die. When it disappears, it leaves behind anything it was wearing or carrying. If you cast the spell again, you decide whether you summon the Steed that disappeared or a different one. When you cast it with a higher level spell slot, use higher level whenever the spell's level appears in the stat block. The Otherworldly Steed stat block. A large Celestial Fae or Fiend. You choose which one you cast. The AC is 10 plus 1 per spell level. Hit points are 5 plus 10 per spell level. The Steed has a number of hit dice, D10s, equal to the spell's level. It has a speed of 60 feet, a fly speed of 60 feet, but it requires a 4th level spell or higher to do that. Strength 18 plus 4, Dex 12 plus 1, Con 14 plus 2, Intelligence 6 minus 2, Wisdom 12 plus 1, Charisma 8 minus 1, Passive Perception 11. Telepathy, one mile only between you and the Steed. You have a mile of telepathy. Mm -hmm. Proficiency bonus is the same as you. Life Bond. When you regain hit points from a spell of first level or higher, the steed regains the same number of hit points if you are within five feet of it. Actions. Otherworldly Maul. Your spell attack modifier to hit, range of five feet, one target, deals 1d8 plus the spell's level of radiant damage if it's celestial, psychic damage if it's fey, or necrotic damage if it is fiend. You also have a bonus action determined by the type of creature you choose. Fey, it regain all of these recharge on a long rest. For the fey, it is fey stepped. The steed teleports along with its rider to an unoccupied space of your choice within 60 feet. The fiend, fell glare. The steed's eyes gleam with fiendish light as it targets one creature it can perceive up to 60 feet away. The target must succeed a wisdom saving throw against your spell save DC or have the frightened condition until the end of turn. And then celestials get healing touch. The steed touches another creature and restores a number of hit points equal to 2d8 plus the spell's level. Why could they not design the wild shape stat blocks like this. This is much better than any of the wild shape options. Yeah, this is very reminiscent of the Tasha's College of Everything summoning spells. Yes. Um, where where this is exactly the format. You you got special abilities based on what form you chose, and then as higher as you cast at higher levels, the better it got. Mm -hmm. Um yet yeah, this the the 2014 version is much more uh you know, confu it's it's less straightforward and a little bit less powerful, I think. Much more basic. Much more basic. Basically, you choose what form it takes, be it a warhorse, pony, camel, elk, or mastiff. Um, bump that creature's intelligence to five. And then, uh, you know, if it disappears at the end of the spell. Yeah. You can ride it. This is, mu in this mount, is in much, much better. much better. I think it is an interesting design choice that they are leaning the paladin into mounted combat, making it very easy to get a mount, 
meaning you don't have to worry about barding or your mount dying mm-hmm. or all this kind of stuff. You get it at fifth level. They're encouraging you to do mounted combat. Yes. Which the current mounted combat rules kind of suck. suck. <laughs> if you are riding the horse, it cannot attack. You can attack or you can use your action to cause it to attack, I believe. I'm not well versed on mounted combat. You know, it, it doesn't come up a lot. It doesn't come up a lot. The fact that you can cast it once per day for free at third level is nice. You can choose to upcast it with higher level spell slots. When you get higher levels, you can get fly speed with it. You get buffs to your AC, your hit points for the steed, all this kind of stuff. A lot of very unique abilities that you the steed can do as a bonus action. Mm-hmm. Big fan. Let's just hope that they do enough to those mounted combat rules to make this worth it. To make this mm-hmm. not, you know, I mean, the extra attack is great, but make this not a dead level otherwise. Because, yeah. like, they, the Paladin always has a very specific, based on your subclass, lore. Yeah. A very specific role play instruction. Oh, yeah. Um, and I feel like adding in the Faithful Steed mechanic is just adding on there. Mm-hmm. But... I don't hate it. I don't they, hate it either. If you give me something good to do with it, I'm I'm going to do it. The fact that they didn't include mounted combat rules in this UA, I think is a big blunder on their part. Yeah. Cuz we can't really you can't really evaluate this feature without knowing what changes they are going to make to mounted combat. At 6th level, you get your subclass feature. At 7th level, you get aura of protection. You radiate a protective invisible aura that extends 10 feet from you in every direction, but does not extend through total cover. You and your allies in the aura gain a bonus to saving throws equal to your charisma modifier, minimum of one. If another paladin is present, a creature can benefit from only one aura of protection at a time. The creature chooses which when entering the auras. Uh, so that's bumped back a level from the 2014 version. How dare they? How dare they? Um, but other than that, uh, it is pretty much the same. One of the few ways to boost saving throws just statically across the board for both the Paladin character itself and other characters, especially when you get to higher levels. That is a very big deal. Oh, yeah. It's when saving throws get to be like DC 24 you're going to need a, a chonky, yeah, you're going to need something to help you out there. Especially for saving throws that you're not proficient in. Yes. And then, like you said, there's very few things that boost those. And that's, mm-hmm. by, I believe, intentionally by design. Yes. Now, the ruling specifically on multiple paladins, totally fine. Delaying a level sucks, but it puts it in line with all the other classes. I'm fine with it. Yes, I don't see anything wrong with that. Eighth level, you get a feat. Ninth level, abjure foes. As a magic action, you can expend a use of Channel Divinity. So this is a new option for the Channel Divinity. At level 9, you also get three uses of... Or sorry, at level 10, you get three uses of your Channel Divinity. So the next level, you have more uses of it per day. Mm -hmm. But as a magic action, you can expend a use of your Channel Divinity to overwhelm foes with Divine Awe. As you present your holy symbol or weapon, you can target a number of creatures equal to your Charisma modifier, minimum of one, that you can see within 60 feet of yourself. Each target must make a wisdom saving throw. On a failed save, the target has the dazed and frightened conditions for one minute or until it takes any damage. On a successful save, the target has only the dazed condition for one minute or until it takes any damage. So you are automatically inflicting dazed Mm -hmm. and you are getting a chance to inflict frightened as well. I'm going to scroll down so we can get a refresher on the dazed condition. Yeah, dazed we saw in a previous uh, uh one D D play test. I don't remember which one it got dropped in, but we we were saying this is gonna come in this better come into play more because it's actually yes, pretty decent. It is good. Here, dazed. While dazed, you experience the following effect. Limited activity. You can move or take one action on your turn, not both. You cannot take a bonus action or a reaction. Yeah, that's chonk. That is especially because this is automatic. Yes. There is no save to resist the dazed portion of this effect. This is a very good ability. Yeah, you're doing, and you're doing this to, well, this is a night at night level nine. You're probably going to have at least plus four to your charisma, if not plus five. Yeah. Uh, you, it, yeah, you, you're going to, you're going to take out quite a few things. One minute of, or even just one round of a boss monster getting one action or one movement, and that is it. Yeah. 
is very useful. Again, they lose the dazed condition if they take any damage, mm-hmm. but it's also great to limit a massive swarm of mobs when you're in a fight, and then you can focus down the one thing that didn't get dazed, yeah. or just pick one of them and start ch- uh, chunking them off. They can't all move to you and attack. They can do one or the other. I think this is a great, great ability. This is this is very reminiscent of how the sleep spell is very useful against low-level enemies, mm-hmm. except they managed to take it up to a ninth level and still make it pretty good. I, I think this is going to be one of the premier options for your channel divinity once you hit level 9. I agree. Level 10, you get another subclass feature. At level 11, you get Radiant Strikes. You are so suffused with divine might that your weapon strikes carry supernatural power. When you hit a target with an attack roll using a simple or martial weapon, the target takes an additional 1d8 radiant damage. No punchy paladin boon. Yeah. Womp womp. You also can't do it with a net. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's highly unfortunate. Uh, again, um, <laughs> but you can still do it with the, with the range weapon. Yes, this is true. Uh, whereas, of course... In in 2014, they said they must be swordmen or axemen, but no bowmen. Is the paladin a better ranger? Paladin might be a better ranger, buddy. Fuck. I love the ranger. This sucks. Okay. Level 12, <laughs> you get a feat. Level 13, you get the aura of courage. You and your allies are immune to the frightened condition while in your aura of protection. If a frightened ally enters the aura, the condition is suppressed while the ally is there. Note it still keeps the frightened condition if it leaves your aura or if you move away from that creature. But while in the aura, it is suppressed and will not suffer the effects of the frightened condition. Yeah, this was the level 10 ability for 5e um, where creatures friendly to you and you could not be frightened while you're conscious. Um, So this is better. Yeah, you do get the buff of suppressing it if it already has it and Mm -hmm. then enters your aura it's delayed a couple of levels which is eh, but i would rather have this delayed than something like radiant strikes or the abjure foes yes i agree and and this i think there's not a huge amount of tactical sense in a lot of fights in D D. yeah um and when it comes to how pcs put themselves in danger i think this could actually manipulate how a dm could run a a combat very well absolutely absolutely at 14th level you get your last subclass feature at level 15 you get restoring trusts oh restoring trusts i'm it i'm tired (laughs) getting that hernia keeping it in there (laughs) 15th level you get restoring touch when you use your lay when you use lay on hands on a creature you can also remove one or more of the following conditions from the creature blinded charmed dazed deafened frightened paralyzed or stunned you must expend five hit points from the healing pool of lay on hands for each of these conditions you remove those points don't also restore hit points to the creature so now instead of just removing the poisoned condition you can now remove basically any condition yeah i'm into it it's a bit it seems a bit weird that it's this late I think they could tack this on to the uh, the lay on hands feature and just put a level assignment to them and give something different here. It's a little bit of a of a womp womp at level 15, but it's they, fine. Yeah, they could have spread it out, um, but they're, they're basically combining the uh, greater and lesser restoration spells and giving it to you for five points of lay on hands. Mm-hmm. This so is true. not bad. Not bad. Not bad. Because what? Well, greater restoration is a fifth? fifth yeah so that's pretty that's a yeah that's a sizable that's so a sizable you, you're spell. now you're now the gorgon hunter perfect perfect uh well petrified is not on the list oh that's true paralyzed is but not petrified not petrified that's unfortunate add so petrified. maybe it's just lesser it might just be lesser restoration then. yeah add petrified to the list then become the gorgon hunter yes at level 16, you get a feat. At level 17, your aura expands from 10 feet to 30 feet. At level 18, you get Divine Conduit. Whenever you roll initiative, you regain a use of your class's channel divinity. At level 19, you get a feat. At level 20, you get the Epic Boon, which again, they have added the Ability Score Increase feature, which increases your one of your Ability Scores by 2, and it can go above 20 but not above 30, in addition to the Epic Boon feat. So I will say with the 18th level, we saw it here and with Druid. I can't remember if we saw it with like say, uh, any other classes, but where you regain one when you roll initiative, that used to be some classes' 20th level ability. Yeah. And while 
while it's still maybe not the greatest or the most um, most impressive thing you could do at 18th level, I do like that it is not the pinnacle of, yeah. oh, wow, I'm the best druid that there's ever been. I'm the best paladin there's ever been. I can one more time change. Change. Or, yeah. 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 or do exactly. a thing. I, li- I like the, s- the standardization of the level 20 ability of just, here's an epic boon. You can figure out what you want. You're level 20. Who gives a shit? Get one of your ability scores above 20. Uh, uh, fight a Tarrasque. Have at it. <laughs> For the subclasses, we get the Oath of Devotion. You get the Tenets of Devotion, Honesty, Courage, Compassion, Honor, Duty, <laughs> Lore. Duty. Duty. <laughs> at third level, we're, we're the fucking worst. Yes. At third level, you get Oath Spells. You get Prepared Spells. You have certain spells that are ready. When you reach a paladin level specified in the Oath of Devotion spells table, you thereafter always have the listed spells prepared. They do not count against the number of spells you can prepare, and they follow the rules of the paladin spellcasting feature. Free casting! You can cast one of your prepared spells from this feature without expending a spell slot. You must finish a long rest before doing so. At third level, you have protection from evil and good and shield of faith. At fifth level, you have aid and zone of truth. At ninth level, you have aura of vitality and blinding smite. At level 13, you have guardian of faith and staggering smite. And at level 17, you have commune and flame strike. Once per day, you can cast one of those spells Mm -hmm. for free. For free. Totally fine. I like it. Uh, I I, they've also, as we've seen with other um, spell lists, they've really uh, honed in on what you're supposed to be doing with this class. These have all quickly, uh, they you know they've added, uh, they've changed some into making them more um, attack based, uh, being the branding smite and staggering smite, as opposed to freedom of music, uh, freedom of movement. Yeah, and uh, freedom from music is also a great, <laughs> yes. a great anti bard feature. Yeah. But the previous ones, the third level, were protection from good and evil and sanctuary, lesser restoration and zone of truth at fifth level, at ninth beacon of hope and dispel magic. 13th were Freedom of Movement and Guardian of Faith, and 17th were Commune and Flame Strike. Mm-hmm. So, some improvements on the spell selection. You get a free cast of them. They're always prepared. Love it. Also, at third level, you get Sacred Weapon. As a bonus action, you can expend the use of your channel divinity to imbue one simple or martial weapon that you are holding with positive energy. For one minute, you add your Charisma modifier to attack rolls made with the mi- with the weapon, minimum of one, and each time you hit with it, you cause it to deal its normal damage type or radiant damage. The weapon also emits bright light for 20 feet, dim light for 20 feet beyond that. You can also end this effect as a bonus action. The effect also ends if you are not holding or carrying the weapon or if you have the incapacitated condition. A nice little buff to hit. Yeah, so uh, before the third level gave you channel divinity, your two channel divinity options being one sacred weapon. Um, The only difference as I'm glancing over it, you can't choose which type of damage it does. Mm. Um, but then it also gave you the turn, the unholy ability. Yeah, that's fine. Whatever. Um, is is the paladin a better ranger? Is the paladin the paladin might be a right, better ranger, buddy? I think. Shit. Shit. I love the ranger, man. I, I know. You might have to love a paladin here. Man, the paladin is just going to be a more powerful combat ranger. Damn. I love it, but damn. <laughs> Especially if you pick the the archery fighting style at level two, and then at level three, you can just add your charisma modifier to hit, and then you take sharpshooter, and then it... still got your spell casting. Smite you can them. smite them. You can, you can divine smite or cast a smite spell and sharpshooter, and you're going to be getting like a static plus like six to hit on top of everything, basically negating anything sharpshooter gives you. Though they changed sharpshooter, they did change sharpshooter. I'm, I'm still upset about that. I digress. At sixth level, you get Smite of Protection. (laughs) Your Divine Smite... I find that fucking hilarious. Your Divine Smite now radiates protective energy that allows you and your allies to stay in the fight. Whenever you use your Divine Smite, choose yourself or an ally within 30 feet of yourself. The chosen creature gains temporary hit points equal to 1d8 plus the level of spell slot used for the Divine Smite. That's that's some flavor. That's... (laughs) That is some flavor. I wish it was you struck your your allies with with the sword. <laughs> Smack them. <laughs> it's like the it's be like, protected. Whack. It's the it's the Tasha's um, monk subclass where you do oh the way of, of he- mercy punches of healing. <laughs> I love that. Uh, yeah. Previously, uh, previously, 
Previously, there was no such ability given. That's totally fine. I think I like this. That's fun. Yeah, totally fine. Nice little buff. Tenth level, you get the aura of devotion. You and your allies are immune to the tar- charmed condition while you're in your aura of protection. If a charmed ally enters your aura, the condition is suppressed while your ally is there. Same thing for charmed that you get for frightened. Previously, the seventh level aura of devotion. Totally fine. Uh, you could flip flop them, but uh, or whatever. Yeah, pretty much whatever. Level fourteenth, the holy nimbus. As a bonus action, you can imbue your aura of protection with holy power. The aura gains the following benefits for one minute or until you end them as a bonus action radiant damage whenever an enemy starts its turn in the aura that creature takes radiant damage equal to your proficiency bonus plus your charisma modifier sunlight the aura is filled with bright light that is sunlight once you use this feature you can't use it again until you finish a long rest you expend a spell slot of at least fourth level when you use it again unless you expend a spell slot of fourth so you can use it multiple times but you have to cast it a second time with a fourth level spell slot which previously holy nimbus was the 20th level ability same idea uh it did have just a flat 10 damage Mm -hmm. which now i believe it's still if you're if you're building your paladin optimally uh still probably 10 damage maybe nine uh it would get up to 11 it could be 17th but it would be 10 at 13th and so on and so on and so forth um, other than and the only the only major difference is again we're take I guess we're going away from the undead and fiend hatred of paladins as when during the duration paladins used to have advantage on saving throws against spells cast by fiend or yeah. dead. Now you just hate vampires. Always. <laughs> Screw you, Strahd. Uh, straight up benefit. I'm into it. Uh, especially. In- this is, this is a note. The Paladin has access to the Divine Spell List. They do. That is one of the sneakiest buffs that is in this class because you get access to spells. Oh my god, I cannot believe I'm forgetting the bomb third level <laughs> cleric spell. Oh, I hate myself. I hate you too. I'm so tired. <laughs> <laughs> the Spirit Guardians. Spirit Guardians. You get access to Spirit Guardians, I believe, at ninth level. At ninth level, you get access to the Spirit Guardian spell. At fourteenth level, you get access to this Holy Nimbus aura benefit. Um, Spirit Guardians plus Holy Nimbus plus what, whatever. What the fuck else ever you got going on? You are going to lock down the battlefield so hard within thirty feet of you. Yeah. Screw any minions. Screw, fuck anything that tries to get close to you, which even kind of encourages more of a ranged play because they have to take so much damage and go through all of these effects just to get close to you. And if you have a lot of spellcasters or other ranged uh, combat happening around you, you can more easily keep your squishy spellcasters within your aura. Yeah. Fucking love it. Paladin is the better ranger. Paladin is the better ranger, buddy. I am saddened by this. Good. Good. I enjoy that about you. But alas, here we are. Uh, I think the last thing we should go over, there's been some updates to the various smite spells as well, which is an important thing before we recap the paladin. Uh, You have banishing smite, uh, blinding smite, various other smites. The main change to these smites... The casting time is a bonus action, which you take immediately after hitting a creature with a weapon or an unarmed strike. The duration is one minute, often without concentration, meaning you can maintain concentration on whatever spell you want and then still get these bonus action smite spells happening. Sadly, you cannot stack them with divine smite anymore. No. But they're assuming that you would want to use these smite spells the same way you would use a divine smite. Yeah. Um... And previously, a lot of the times, at least when I played a paladin, I would not take these spells because they are they're cool. Sure, they are a little bit of a, bon- a bonus damage buff, but man, there are just so many cool concentration spells. I don't want to drop those for this yeah. when I could just regular smite. And now they've debuffed to the regular smite enough that they're encouraging the use of these by removing the concentration effect, which... I still think you should be allowed to divine smite on I- top of casting one of these smite spells. Yeah, burn. You know what? They're, Let them go supernova. That's fine. You you burn them out, and then the, 
do more event during that yep. day. You know what? You've got a couple of different options. The Banishing Smite is 5d8 force, and you can have a chance to banish someone. Blinding Smite is 3d8 radiant, and then they might be blinded. Uh, gosh. Glimmering Smite, which used to be... Uh, it used to be one of the other smite spells, but I'm forgetting the name of it. Uh, this one does require concentration. Uh, deals an extra 2d8 radiant, and if it has the invisible condition, the condition ends. In addition, until the spell ends, the target sheds bright light, and attack rolls against it have an advantage. So that's why you want to concentrate on this one, because for mm-hmm. up to a minute, everybody can have advantage on their attack rolls against that creature. Uh, Searing Smite does an extra 1d6 fire and ignites the creature. Uh, at the start of each of your turns, until the spell ends, the target must make a con saving throw. On a fail, it takes 1d6 fire damage. On a success, the spell ends. This is also a concentration smite. Uh, Thunder smite is instant, does not require concentration, deals an extra 2d6 thunder damage, and if the target is a creature, it must succeed a strength save or be pushed 10 feet away from you and have the prone condition. So you knock it prone and away from you. And then Wrathful Smite is one of the concentration smites. Uh, deals an extra 1d6 psychic damage. They have to succeed a wisdom saving throw or become frightened until the spell ends at the end of each of its turns. It can repeat the saving throw, ending it on a success. The Paladin. The Paladin. In many ways, got some nice buffs in Streamline. Mm-hmm. In some ways, it... As, as we kind of talked before on our own, before we started recording the podcast, in many ways, the Paladin got a lot of nice utility and a lot of nice buffs that make it a more well-rounded character at the expense of stripping it of some of what its core yeah. was. And kind of the same with the Druid. It stripped out the main core of it in a lot of ways. And that's, I think, the big problem with this playtest. Yeah. Um I've mentioned we've mentioned it multiple times the min maxers people who love to just dig their dig their toes in and find the most optimal build for a character paladin and druid were just used in so many builds um and wizards does say that they they want to take away from the idea that there is a best option that yeah. there is a reason you that they're afraid that everybody is just going to choose the do the one thing um I think that that is maybe a little too highfalutin. They're thinking a little too big there. Yeah. Uh, because people play all sorts of things because people love to play all sorts of things. You don't play, you know, not everybody playing a paladin wants to play a paladin because it's the best class to play. Or not everybody wants to play a druid because you can become a bear and and that's the best thing you can, or a, or a you know, fire element, whatever. It doesn't. Um, and I think in in pursuit of equalizing everything they ended up killing what people loved about a lot of these classes yeah the paladin i think survived a lot better i agree the druid is just neutered entirely and that's just that i think that's really a shame uh it hurts my soul that the uh just play a just play a fighter with a bow is going to now be replaced by just play a paladin with a bow Give the Rangers some fucking love, man. <laughs> it's bad. It was better. The play t- the one D and D play test was oh, yeah. so much better, but like, come on. Uh, lastly, unless you have anything else you want to say about the Druid of Paladin. Uh, no. Okay. We'll go over the change log real quick for the rules glossary. There's some new entries, the dying condition, knocking a creature out, short rest and telepathy and the unconscious condition. Uh, They revised some entries, the D20 test, rolling a one on a D20 no longer rewards inspiration, which is now called heroic advantage. Don't know why they felt the need to change that. Difficult terrain, your allies are no longer difficult terrain for you, and furniture is difficult terrain if it's one size smaller than you or larger. Interesting. Equipping weapons is now a subset of action. Clarified how weapon equipping and unequipping works. Uh, Fly speed changed from what causes you changed what causes you to fall grappling condition movable and escape sections are changed the help action now works with tool proficiencies heroic advantage is the name change for inspiration incapacitated condition clarified that it is still blocks bonus actions (laughs) so well i'm knocked out could i like cast misty step yeah (laughs) It doesn't say I can't. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the long rest changes have been made to every section of the rule. 
Uh, move. Moving around other creatures and changes to your speed sections have changed. The latter was formerly called speed of zero. And then finally, the unarmed strike, grappling, and shoving are no longer delivered by an attack roll. That was one of the weird things. It was. That we discussed in a previous one D&D conversation. They also removed entries on the ability check, attack roll, climbing, and swimming speed, which is now a subsection of move, dash, hidden condition, the jump action, the slowed condition, and then special sle- speeds, which are also a subsect of move. Uh, sad they, got rem- they removed the slowed condition. I thought that was going to be one of the fun ones. I did too. Um, we, yeah, we had a lot of, of cool ideas for that as we were reading through it. I don't know. I do, I do, I just found this funny when it says difficult terrain, the furniture, furniture is difficult terrain if it's one size smaller than you or larger, so technically, like, a wardrobe is now just technically difficult terrain, so you can totally, uh, uh, Kool-Aid man through it. Mm Mm-hmm. I, (laughs) I think, I think that's a fun, I think that's a fun rules change simply because, like, now you can do the, ooh, we're running through the building and now I'm throwing over bookcases Mm, and creating difficult terrain behind me. And the ranger, or I don't remember if the ranger got their difficult terrain move, but somebody who doesn't have difficult terrain, okay, now they're tumbling over tables yeah. and sliding under chairs. and that That is a cool change, I will I, say. Yeah. A very small, minor one. That being said, that is the entirety of the one D&D playtest for the druid and the paladin. Uh, they did, we'll move on from this. There's a couple small things to cover. Uh, the cleric one D&D playtest results, they made a video talking mm-hmm. about that. Uh talking about some of the changes and some fun things they uh they're not just looking at the positive reaction or the percentage of approval they're also looking at are people saying they're fine with something like they're not excited for anything Mm -hmm. and they removed the ardling race or sorry species I still hate that term doesn't seem I hate it. But they removed the Ardling as a species option. It's a character option. option. Yes. Uh, Citing that while people were not upset with the Ardling, nobody was really excited for it. And so they're going to save the Ardling for a future uh, rule supplement where it would make more sense. I think that's perfectly fine. Um, And and if they they want to try to build a little bit of hype Mm -hmm. around it, like, oh, hey, you know. It won't be in this first, it won't be in 2023 that we drop it, but maybe in 2020, the first, the first cauldron of everything, the first of everything. Yeah. I think that'd be a totally fine, I'm, I'm, I'm totally okay with that. And I think that speaks to what their thought process is a little bit with designing one D&D, which I think is positive. Absolutely. Uh, they also announced that the next Unearthed Arcana, they're going to release them a little bit further apart. We're not going to get one every month like we were in 2022. We kind of saw that. They mm-hmm. kind of, it seems like they delayed a lot of this because of the OGL stuff, but it, that's just the way they're going. They're going to release one every couple of months. The next one is going to be expected in April, and they called it, quote unquote, Chonky. Speaking my language. So I suspect it's going to be warriors along with weapons. Ooh, yeah. Which is... I look forward to that. It's going to be very good. Uh, and they're going they're going to start releasing them every month. You can watch that video on D&D Beyond's YouTube. But they also have great videos with uh, Chris Perkins. No, yeah, Chris Perkins. Chris Perkins. Where they're talking about their design philosophy with the one D&D playtest, which is a great, great watch. Highly recommend. Lastly... Commander Masters. Commander Masters. Yeah, so they announced another set that will be arriving in August of this year. This is for Magic the Gathering. This is for Magic the Gathering. Thank you. Yes, yes, I, I uh, we didn't specify. We didn't specify. Um and it is going to be a set full of reprints uh for your favorite uh, as, as well. Yeah. Mr. Over. It's a master set. Commander's Masters is comprised of both reprints as well as new powerful cards. Um we're going to see a lot of return to old uh, cards, such as Slivers. Uh, there's going to be a pre-constructed Planeswalkers deck, uh, an Enchantments deck, as well as a, what is the last one? An Eldrazi Colorless deck. Uh, gross. So those are going to be all fun. There is also going to be gross. set boosters, draft boosters, collector's boosters, Um Remember, weren't ma- weren't master sets supposed to be reprint exclusive? They were, but this one's going to include new and powerful cards. Mm-hmm. Um, sure. So we're going to get first look at uh, at these new cards on May and May sixteenth of this year. 
Uh, we're going to have the preview event starting in the end of July, and then tabletop launch will be August 4th. Um, right. Right during Gen Con. Right during Gen Con. The only thought I have on this is, um, woof. These are expensive. Very expensive. Uh, if you like the master sets, good for you. You've got another very expensive option available to you. Um, like three hundred dollars for a draft booster. Yeah. Hey, the alt, the the foil etched jeweled lotus and the frame break borderless jeweled lotus looks cool. They're doing they're doing uh, it, some some cards that have never been reprinted, like capture of uh, Jinzo, which comes from a very old set. Yeah, um, Lo- love it. <laughs> I don't know. The 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 reprint exclusive sets I'm fine with. We we loved the Dominaria remastered, mm-hmm. which I believe also wasn't entirely reprints. I think there were a couple of original cards in there. I could be speaking directly out of my butthole right now. I think they were all reprints. Regardless. It's way too expensive. It is very <laughs> it's expensive. So expensive. Why are they making commander decks? For Commander Masters, and they're making these fucking unhinged I love pre-cons. That. They're doing a Sliver deck, a Planeswalker deck, an Eldrazi deck, and then here's some fucking enchantments. What? <laughs> See, what gets me is they're calling it Commander Masters. Commander, a set or a game style you don't draft for, and yet they're selling draft boosters. Yep. That's a dumb thing. Right. Like okay, you want me? You want to give me just a bunch of reprints that just just make the set booster the option? Yeah, that we we've, we've talked about. At people have been talking ad nauseum about Magic the Gathering fatigue. Mm-hmm. Oh my god, yes. It, and the Tolarian Community College, the professor did a great video talking about the idea of fatigue uh, that a lot of people were feeling after they were like, "Hey, here's some March of the Machine stuff. Hey, here's Lord of the Rings thing. Hey, here's Commander Masters. All this kind of stuff." And it's like they're not. I don't think they're releasing too many lines of pro- like Lord of the Rings. Fine, Commander Masters. Fine, March of the Machines. Fine, but do they all need set boosters, collector boosters, draft boosters, commander decks, mm-hmm. f- like all of the variants? Like now we like what certain cards are only in draft. Some certain cards are only in set boosters. They're card that are exclusive to the commander decks. They're like. It, it, it's too much. Yeah. Too much with it. Like, if they wanted to do Commander Masters, pre-con Commander decks, totally makes sense. Absolutely. Set boosters, fine. Yeah. Let, maybe just leave it at that. Maybe make a deck, not four, that are probably going to be way over the power curve of most every other Commander pre-con <laughs> that we've seen. And if, man, if they do it badly they're gonna get a lot of kick like because the, the warhammer 40k decks that came out last oh, year the so universe good. beyond fantastic design a lot of lot of praise for those and now they're just freaking expensive no matter where you look mm-hmm. uh and that's kind of what people i think are just going to expect from something this price point yep and note the eldrazi commander deck is the first colorless yes commander precon which by the way colorless just the sixth color that's in like, every deck pretty it's, much. Yeah, pretty much it's in the morphing color i'd be shocked if they managed to make a bad sliver swarm deck i mean sliver is like it's kind of easy to make a good one you just we, put a lot put a lot of slivers on the battlefield there you go they they They're did all good now they did all their work back you know 20 years ago yeah planeswalker is going to be interesting it's also interesting that it's only white blue red enchantments is white black green i don't know we'll see uh, probably not going to be, but I, I don't know if I want to be buying any of these cause it's going to be fucking outrageously expensive. Maybe if we're really good, we'll get just a single s- booster pack each. Maybe, maybe we'll, we'll put a down payment for that. All right. We'll mortgage the apartment. Yeah, sure. We, we can, can, we can mortgage a rental property, right? Absolutely. That we don't own. <laughs> put a lien on it. We'll put a, we'll put a lien on it. Uh, hey, those light bulbs. With that being said, we have come to the end of the major news items of the day. Uh, if you like what you've heard, you can listen to the podcast on your podcast service of choice, Apple, Google, Spotify, microwave ovens, Pandora. Pandora is below the microwave oven now. Yes. We're not even sure if Pandora still exists. Yes. We also post the podcast on YouTube. You can follow us on TikTok, Instagram, Twitter. Join our Discord server where 
Almost 300 people of you already do. Hey. You can ask us questions in the Discord server. There's an entire channel for podcast submissions. And we'd love if you did. We'd love you if you did. We love talking at you. Absolutely. But we also record this podcast live on the TikTok, and we will end the podcast as we always do with comments, questions, thoughts, concerns, ideas, and the like from the TikTok live chat. All right. Ravi Barbosa really wants us to come to Brazil. I'm sorry, Ravi. We cannot. Yep. Not doing it. Too expensive. Um, and by too expensive, I mean plane tickets. Yeah. And lodging. And I'm poor. Dungeons My Dragons is enjoying a call of another deep campaign. We were talking about that. Good for them. Uh, Here we go. Marcy Anno a- Adrian. Uh, any necromancer beginners tips? Ooh. Yes. Don't, Don't play, play the ne- necromancer <laughs> class or wizard subclass. <laughs> we were both about to say the same damn thing. <laughs> we yeah. have there is there is a homebrew subclass option for the wizard for free for free available to you on Drive Through RPG. Link in the link tree in the bio created by us, the Dungeon Bros. Yes, um, that is better. <laughs> the problem with the with the written necromancer stuff for the wizard, especially, is it doesn't let you do what you want to do, which is just raise hordes of dead. Um, it, it mostly wants you to siphon life from things, do necrotic damage, and generally just kind of exist. Uh, so yeah, that's my that's our suggestion. Don't do that. Play uh, honestly. There are some warlock. There are some sorcerer. There's spores some, druid. Spores druid. Much better options. Much much better. All right. Uh, what are your hair products, Dan Bro? Both you, ha, huh? looking fresh. Wow. Thank you, uh, 420 Pike Sim- Spike Simpson 69. Uh, you have better hair than me, but I I have a very rigorous hair routine, I say sarcastically, of a wonderful suave men's three-in-one shampoo, conditioner, body wash, which actually I have received many compliments about the softness of my hair from my various hairdressers in my life. And every time they're like, what products do you use? And I say, suave men's three-in-one. They all give me the same shock and horrified look. Uh, and then I've also uh, noticed that my hair is thinning in the crown of my head. So Oof. I've been doing some uh, niacin, I think it's called, treatment. It's just like it's just like a little spray thing. Like after you, after you get out of the shower while your hair is wet, you just massage it into the scalp. And I might be working. <laughs> it was suggested to me by the guy that cuts my hair. Oh, okay. So there you go. Should check out Harry's. I, I should. Or we should. We should try to get sponsored by Harry's. Everybody else does. <laughs> keeps. Keeps. Yes. Keeps from in. Uh, Alan P. really wants us to fix the... Wait, no. What's your hair? What is your hair oh. process? You're the one that has the fucking man ponytail bun thing. <laughs> uh, I wash it every week. Weekly? Yes. I only wash it once a week. That's disgusting. As you get longer hair, you don't wash it every day. I know. My hair never gets that long. <laughs> Uh, it was a that was the biggest change in my life over the past couple of years is going from I used to have buzz cut from going to just scratching it out every day, you know, and now I just like when was the last time I washed my hair? Yeah, I should probably wash it. Yeah. 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 Wash, condition, comb. No, not comb. Brush. I comb. Go to the hairdresser every once a, in a I while. Have a br- I have a brush for my beard. Occasionally, if I'm going to an event, I do have some a uh, mat mm, moose some moose that'll keep the hair swifty to the side if you will got to got to look swifty for him yes uh thank you i don't think i've ever been complimented on my hair before so that's awesome thank you alan p really wants us to fix the stibbles poster no that's... i think it's actually just the lens yeah we do we do put an extra lens on the live and it kind of distorts the edge a little bit so oops Sorry. Um, oh, the person who asked about our hair, 420 Spike Simpson 69, said they also use Suave. <gasps> Sand Love Tiger. It. Love it. Was the one who gifted. Gifted us again later. Yeah. We, uh, people have been gifting us in the live streams lately, which we do do live streams. Uh, do do. <laughs> We've been doing live streams of us playing Magic the Gathering. As we previously mentioned at the beginning of the podcast, we do Commander, Two Player, and we've also got jumpstart boosters that we've been doing. That's the time to come hang out with us. We chat. We we make fun of each other. You make fun of us. It's great. It's l- it's the best way to interact with the Dungeon Bros. Uh, the Banger Beat says, "Does Magic: The Gathering have a sp- have speed spell?" What? I don't know. I mean, you there, there's spells that have haste. There's probably a spell called speed. I don't know if there's S- boots of speed. There's boots of speed. There's instance which can be played at at uh, instant speed. Yeah, you can you can do speed while playing magic. 
Yeah. People even call it speed. Like an eight ball speed? Yeah. Yeah. It's still called speed. That's still hip. I'm sure. In, still I think in lingo. like theater cir- circles. Yeah, that checks out. Um... I don't know why that checks out. <laughs> <laughs> to any of our theater friends out there, we're... Not sorry. I'm not sorry. Write in and tell us if, if you actually use speed and call it speed. Uh, Adventures of a uh, of a fatty of a fat baddie, Ooh. formerly known as Dungeon P- Mistress Paula. Oh, Dungeon Mistress Paula. We love her. Dropped in and said, drive by love, heart. We love Dungeon Mistress Paula. She is a force of so much good. She does. Yes, she is. All of the good in the TikTok D&D sphere. Go check her out. Yes. And she changed her name because of the OGL stuff, I believe. So I don't know. Very, very good. How about it? Uh, the Them Boy DM uh, tells us that we should check out Dungeon Crawl Classics. Dungeon Crawl Classics is a very popular uh, alternate t- TTRPG. It's been around forever. The books are in that old style. I looked at a lot of Dungeon Crawl Classics stuff at their booth at Gen Con mm. last fall. Uh, we, I have one of the free That's supplements right. that they yeah, handed out. That. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's wonderfully, the, the books are beautiful. If you really like that old, like nineties, eighties, seventies, TTRPG book style, uh, mostly seventies and eighties, but I've, I've heard nothing but good things about dungeon crawl classics. I have not really read through the supplement that they gave us. Uh, I probably should do that. It looked really cool. They're really cool people. Uh, I've heard I've heard nothing but positive about the Dungeon Crawl Classic. Maybe we should check it out more someday. We someday, should. Uh, should get it off the shelf. <laughs> find for well, find it. Where is it on the shelf? Pull it out and then put it somewhere so that we see it all the time. And it's like maybe I will flip through that. Uh, Dominus Mort thirty nine says, "God, Grandfather Nurgle hopes you all are having a most pestilent day in a good way." Delicious. I love Nurgle. Raymond Weaving, uh, f- big hype man in the chat yesterday yes, during our uh, said, what's up, fellas? Can only be on for a minute, closing the store down at work. Hope you guys have a great time. Uh, <laughs> just a great. Just a great. Uh, but yeah, just wanted to shout him out, say thanks. Crazy Heath, again, active in yesterday's chat, mm-hmm. uh, popped in. Uh, they're, they're, they're trying to build a channel, it looks like. So, you know, if you have some time, maybe go check them out. Sure. Mm-hmm. Or don't. Or don't. Check, check us out instead. <laughs> crazy Heath, if That's you're awful. if you're crazy Heath, if you want to hop into our Discord, we do have a self promotion channel. Yeah, you can put anytime you post something, you can pop it in the self promotion channel. How about it? Uh, Anyone that creates something, if you join our Discord server, we have the entire channel dedicated to it. And honestly, with the amount of interaction, if you wanted to try and get people to do it by chatting with people in the general channel, I'm okay with it. Right yeah, now. go for it. <laughs> uh Agn Agnar the Valiant is an orc barbarian. They dropped in. They said they just popped in to say hi, I guess. Okay. I'm totally fine. Uh, oh, here we have an actual one. Kyle, Kyler Daters. If a passive wisdom score of a player is higher than the DC of a trap, do they automatically see it? So a passive score can be used to represent a task done at repeatedly or just the average of that task done. Uh, so the prime example in the... Um, handbook is to say specify secret door finding mm-hmm. um well if you spend 10 minutes searching for something this is this this is the role you get yes exactly so do they automatically see it maybe maybe not depending on how you're running it uh but if you if they're say hanging out in the room for a couple minutes then they'd probably see it or if yeah. they just say i inspect it I take, I take the time to go through and search it. It's like, I'm not going to make you roll. You find it. Your passive yeah. is high enough. Now, if you are entering like a long hallway and you're like, is it trapped? Uh, and the investigation is like a DC 14 and someone has a passive of like 16. I might be like, you notice some, you notice some weird uh, indentations in the wall. Like just hint at there being something strange and don't just run through. Yeah. But just straight up being like, oh yeah, there's a trap. They need to look for it. Mm-hmm. Whether or not you make them roll for it, that's that that, that can be up to you guys. Yeah. Uh, friend of the show, Found Familiar Dice, says, Druids all the way. Okay, bye. <laughs> Found Familiar Dice, the official dice sponsor of the Dungeon Bros. Until we get an actual dice sponsor, they will be the official dice sponsor of the Dungeon Bros. As they have been the only ones to send us dice. Look forward to a bonus podcast interview with them here soon. Friend of the show, Beardick Inspiration, dropped in to say, <laughs> uh, you two are awesome. Keep on kicking ass. Beardick, you do the same. You do the same. 
Um, Don't tag us in as many videos. <laughs> Zero J says they did the druid wrong. They did. Emphasis. I'll never use the druid changes even if it's official. Yeah, that is probably going to be very much changed. Yes. Um, I, I What I will say, as we have t- often talked about with the playtests, um, if you don't like it, first off, get in there, get into those surveys, tell wizards yes, what yes, you think. Yes, Absolutely. Secondly, there's enough D&D 5e material that you could play it for the rest of your life. Absolutely. If you don't like one D&D, we highly encourage you, stick with 5e. We'll probably be playing 5e for a long time. For a very, very long time. And... Since everything in 5e is backwards compatible, you can pick and choose. You can. Someone's like, you know, I'm okay with the Divine Smite not being as good. I want to do a 1D&D Paladin. And you're like, but I really want to be a Druid. Just check with the DM and be a 5e Druid and a 1D&D Paladin. Or a 1D&D Cleric and a 5e Warlock. and like You can mix and match. Yeah. It's fine if they don't all progress at the same level. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, one D and D is trying to bring everything kind of into a more linear pattern of of play. Mm-hmm. Uh, like like you said, they're compatible. Um, if you wanted to go back to three point five or four E and try to bring it up to five fifth edition or one D and D, that'd be a monumental task. But thankfully, these two are very you know, very similar. Chuck a book, chuck whichever book you want to use at mm-hmm. at the person. And all you have to do is go back to the history of D and D with a D and D and then later three third edition and all, all this stuff. If people didn't like the changes, those were the additions that died very quickly. Mm-hmm. Third edition was on the way of doing that. Cause people just kept playing a D and D and then they did 3.5 and people love 3.5 and they did 3.5 and then they tried to do fourth edition and fourth edition, four. everyone just kept playing 3.5 and then they did fifth edition. Yeah. So well, once it, yeah once once it comes out twenty twenty three vote with your dollar if the if the pattern continues one D and D might flop and then they might have to do a sixth edition that people actually like if the if the if the pattern of that's true bad set good set bad set good set happens who knows we'll have to see or I mean again there's more five five E material coming out this year oh yeah you, there there we've we've talked about. Dungeons and Dragons fatigue as well as Match of the Gathering fatigue. And there is so much official fifth edition D&D content that you'd probably be set for the the entirety of the 2020s. Because 95 to 99% of people playing D&D are not going to be playing through every D&D release. Mm -hmm. It's just not feasible. No. So... Explore what the official options are. Explore the third party options. There's so many amazing third party. There's so many content creators. There's so many specific homebrew creators. Like, if you don't want to play one D and D, fifth edition is going to be more than enough, probably for the entirety of your lifetime. If they never released another new product, and then beyond that, other systems. Uh, I've been playing Kids on Bikes recently. Mm-hmm. Um, that's been a lot of fun. I was looking at. There's a D. There, there's a uh, rules light system called quest and uh that is that looks like a lot of fun um you know go experiment with some one shots or some mini campaigns yep. you don't have to play for five years with every campaign you play call of cthulhu is exceptionally uh, popular uh, pathfinder is popular uh if if you want to look at a little bit of a weird thing if you're into the cw shows from like the early 2000s kind of vibe Cinderbrush. Mm, it was a one yeah. shot done by critical role a couple of years ago and i really enjoyed that one shot i was very intrigued by that system the idea of like social connections and pulling threads on other players to like get information and get uh like steal like it was it was this weird like kind of we're friends and allies but at the same time we're kind of competing with one another and matt told a really cool story of like high school mom like high school kids that were monsters and all this kind of weird shit and it's an interest. It, just experiment with other things, and that's not even getting into uh, Vampire the Masquerade and like all that kind of shit too. Did you hear Vampire the Masquerade just put out single player rules, or like they're developing single player rules? Cool. Uh, Ginny D did a YouTube video not too long ago, uh, several months ago, talking about playing D and D by yourself and how someone created an entire homebrew system on Fifth Edition D and D that automates the DMing. <laughs> AI DMing that automates the DMing 
for you to play Dungeons and Dragons by yourself. And I thought that was fascinating. I sometimes just stare at the wall and daydream. Mm-hmm. I find that an acceptable option too. That is true. Is that all we have? That's that's all we got for uh, the live. Okay. Well, we're almost at two hours. We're about an hour fifty in on this record, so I think it is as good a time as any to again say the podcast is on YouTube, Apple, Google, Spotify, microwave ovens, Pandora. You've been bumped down. Oh, Kyle Daters, you missed your question. Oh no. Oh no. No. Oh no. Oh. Okay, I see what it was. It was the passive wisdom question. Uh, quick reiteration. Not necessarily. If they spend time looking, then they should automatically see it. But they can't. But if they're just right there, you can have them roll still and just have, have them roll. Maybe like hint that something is afoot. Alert them that they should they should be looking for something. Yeah. Play it however you see fair. If that is the person's build. Then, then maybe, maybe go ahead and let them play with it. Yeah. If they just happen to have it, and they do, if they don't even notice that's their passive wisdom score. Yeah. I, I, yeah. That being said. That being said, you can subscribe to us on YouTube. You can follow us on the Instagram, TikTok. Where we have a Twitter. It's not in our link tree. Uh, we got Homebrew on Drive Through RPG. A lot of it's free. Uh, we have a couple paid options. We want to make more Homebrew, but we're not in a rush to because it all sucks right now. Uh, we got some more YouTube videos in the pipeline. We want to make things. We have ideas. Um, life's hard. It's going to get easier. Life's going to get better for us, probably, hopefully. <laughs> and we're going to play Sliver Decks. Uh, uh, I don't know. Well, we'll see. We love you very much. Thank you guys so much for hanging out again today. And um, we'll, uh, in the meantime... Yeah, whoa, whoa, whoa. You just get up? Yeah. And you don't do your bit? You don't end on your bit? Oh, because usually, I mean, I'm so used to doing it from there. Well, thank you so much for hanging out. I'm not cutting around that. Okay. This is the ending now. Okay, you said you weren't going to cut anything anyway because you're just so tired. Yes, and we have to post it tomorrow.